Hello, everyone, and welcome to our November session of our free Q&A. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who took a moment to join us today. And I have with me, as always, um, Cindy Craft. How are you today, Cindy? I'm good, Sherry. I'm kind of drowning in Oasis E at the moment, but hanging in there. I like to think of it more as a graceful backstroke through the rest of Oasis E. <laughs> Uh, um, we, that would be my goal as well. <laughs> we are learning some really interesting stuff as folks try and take on this new um, Oasis version. Um, and this is what Oasis version number five, Cindy, or I six. I know so. there was. I think there was Maybe. a couple C's, right? C one and C two. Yeah, and a couple D's. But I, I hope to, to retire before we hit Z. Oh, that would be fun. Um, Oasis, Oasis W, that would be weird sounding, but we maybe we'll make it that far. Who knows? Um, so everyone is kind of bogged down in that. So let's just start off our day with some good old Oasis questions. Um, we had the opportunity to meet some people at um, at the NOC annual conference in St. Louis a few weeks ago, and we we found out some interesting things. and And I wanted to tee you off with up with something that really is gonna maybe tee you off was probably that was a Freudian slip, but that was probably appropriate. I wanted to tee you up with the, with probably the most interesting thing that we heard at the conference that made us both go, "What?" Um, you know that that look on your face, "What?" Um, we heard of an agency that has currently more than 10 uh, RN QA folks that sit in the office and literally fill out the OASIS form for their individuals, for their clinicians, from soup to nuts. Cindy, what did we find strange about that? Well, you, first of all, you're going straight for the jugular out of the gate with the first question. Um, I think the first thing was, how do we compose our facial expressions to not look completely shocked? Um, it, it's, it's a model that I think ends up as an extension of when we see, you know, discussions about, you know, being able to scribe that information or doing live phone calls with clinicians while they're in the home to help them improve their assessment, things that can have tremendous value. But when we start crossing a line about, I do it for them, we really have to be careful. And I know it turns into this kind of, you know, it's helpful, it expedites the process, but it's very, very clear in the guidance that the assessing clinician, the person whose name goes on this, is the one who's responsible for this data, is the one who's supposed to be actively involved in response selection. And I think we see varying degrees of attempts to work around this, in this case being, oh yeah, they review it in the end, uh, okay. But how intently are they involved in this? If it, I mean, I could see where as a clinician, someone else filling it out for me would just seem like really, really cool. And am I really going to pay that much attention to the answers? Eh, maybe, maybe not. I might just say it's okay. But now we have a paper trail that says, oh no, they're involved. It's fine. I think the problem with that model um, in terms of sustainability is it, it never gets a clinician to the point where they actually understand fully what these items are and what they're for and how to incorporate them into intentional care planning. But beyond that, Sherry, I also see ones that aren't quite as, as startling as that model. I've been on the war path and I'm just gonna own it. This is more of our unfiltered conversation than it is a formal presentation today, is I think that we're also taking some liberties in our industry with the idea of collaboration. Um, yes, the, the guidance manual says that there can be collaboration. It does not require collaboration of any kind. It simply says that for some of these items, it makes sense that if the assessing clinician wants to get additional information from another clinician, potentially, who's also seen this patient, to then be, you know, okay, now I'm really confident that this is the best response option for this patient. I don't know how this is happening right now, but I'm, what I'm being told is collaboration is not. To say that the assessing nurse, this is a classic example, the admitting nurse completes the document and turns it in, the therapist does the evaluation two days later, and someone in the back office scours all of those visit notes from therapy to find the most involved level of assistance they can, and then says that answer means the nurse needs to change theirs. 
that isn't collaboration. Collaboration means that the nurse and the therapist interacted with each other in some capacity to resolve what we think the best possible response is. But chasing down worst possible answers through a third party does not meet that criteria either. And I hear a lot of, well, we're helping. It's faster. The clinician shouldn't have to double document. The clinician shouldn't have to. These aren't really solutions that fit the compliance issue. These are not how it was it, done, how it was intended to be. And the guidance manual is a big part of that. And, and I think somehow, some way we've turned the guidance manual into this special book that only some people have access to and only special people can interpret. And I've totally forgot that that guidance manu manual was written directly for the clinician. And that's who needs to use it. That's who needs to understand it. And when they do that, they need to collect the data. Yes, they can get support and they can collaborate and do all of those things. But I think we're just seeing an ever increasing movement over the line into gray area, into danger zones on this idea that I can externally fix this and get it where I want it to be as opposed to doing it the way we were told to do it. Well, and, and there's a couple of things, you know, one of the things that we heard when we heard that really drastic way of doing it is we heard that, first of all, they had 10 plus extra nurses that could do oh, right. office work, which was, you know, beyond the rest of the conference, which was, you know, cries for help into the darkness about how bad the staffing issues were. And then to get that on top of it, it just seemed to be completely disconnected with issues of hiring and retaining that other folks are having in home health. So that was probably what really threw us to begin with, because we know there are scribing services out there. We know there are folks that are that are marketing that on a daily basis. And there and there may be some some validity to some of that mm -hmm. um, in order to take some of this paperwork burden off of your clinicians. But Cindy, you said something to me the other day about we need to come to a place of neutrality with Oasis. Oasis has always been in the negative. And we right. try and we've always tried to historically make people become happy with the Oasis. Well, we give up. It, it's, it's about it's about becoming, you know, apathetic, if you will, or have a neutral attitude towards the Oasis because, and I said this to you, the Oasis is what it is. It is part of home health. It is not going anywhere. It is the price that we pay as clinicians for only having to see one patient at a time in the environment that they would prefer to be in. Let me say that one more time. It is the price that we pay in order to be able to see patients one at a time in the environment that they prefer. So that paperwork burden is part of us not being supervised in the house on a daily basis, not having other people in the building with us watching what we're doing each and every day with, with a patient. It is a part of the rules of the game in order to be able to, to be the only providers that only have to see one patient at a time. Right, Cindy? Yeah, I, 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 you said that to me earlier this week and I actually used it in a presentation I did this morning to reiterate that. There's a huge level of accountability in terms of being able to be very clear about what is going on with our patients. We don't have shift changes. We don't have, you know, multitudes of people coming in and out of their room that can validate what's going on with them and, and get different sources. We're by ourselves quite a bit. And in order to then be able to describe the entirety and complexity of the patient, we do have to be specific, whether it's OASIS or in our documentation. And when we get, you know, kind of cavalier about it and expect to be paid because we do med teaching visit after visit after visit without a lot of detail or we're doing gate training and it just keeps getting to a higher and higher number with no context and then we get upset why do we end up in a tp and e and get denials be because you're not addressing why someone of your skill set was warranted to spend this one-on-one -on -one time with a patient so I'm not saying it's ever going to make people love it. I mean, I've said on more than one occasion, Sherry, nobody goes into healthcare because they want to do documentation. I mean, if, if I wanted to write this much, I would have gone into journalism. I would have gone write a novel. I'd have written right. something, you know, I find entertaining. I would never have done this. And I, I'm just, I'm very comfortable saying, I don't believe as students choose this career path that they really understand necessarily what they're getting themselves into in many cases. And so documentation gets put on later 
after you're almost in too far, when you've fallen in love with the concepts of taking care of other people and helping them, and then it's, well, you need to write that. Well, you need to write this. Well, you need to add that. And then it's conflicting information. I remember as a student, Sherry, I would go on my one clinical and they would tell me, you write too much. Nobody reads this. That's, I remember that's exactly what my clinical instructor says. Nobody reads this. You don't need to write so much and made me cut it all back. Well, okay, I'm a student. This is what the smart person told me. So I go to the next clinical and I got reamed initially that I didn't write enough. So I think we kind of give up and go into a, well, just tell me what you want to write. It's always just more requirements. It's always the victim mentality of, isn't this terrible? Oasis included, as opposed to this is how I communicate my worth. This is how I communicate. I absolutely know why I'm with this patient. I know why they need these services. I know that they have mental health issues. I know that they have functional issues. I am just having to describe that a bit more intensely to make the case for this to be a one on one service in the home. So back to what you said, Sherry, I, I would love to see Oasis negativity skyrocket to positivity, but I'm also not delusional. I'm lower in that bar. Negativity to neutrality. It, it's not apathy. It's not I don't care. It's just I am not going to continue to just get upset about it. And as a leader, I'm not going to inadvertently or somewhat intentionally fuel that by keeping the mantra of, isn't this awful? Isn't it terrible? No, I don't know. You don't want to do it. Isn't it awful? You have to do this and just take it to, it is what it is. As you said, Sherry, it's not, oh, isn't this fun? Or they might think you lost your mind, but especially with these new items, so many of them are pieces of information we have never been able to put into the tool before, ever. We've done a lot of things. We've been concerned about their transportation. We've been concerned about health literacy. We've been concerned about what we do with their medications. Yeah, maybe we wouldn't have worded the stuff the way it's worded, but the stuff that's going in there now in 2023 are going to round out that description well beyond do they have wounds? Do they need help walking? Do they need help bathing? And really get into some more of those other elements to say this is really a complicated population of patient we're trying to manage in the home. 100% and we cannot cut out the clinical side of this and, 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 and make it all a paperwork game. Um, clinicians need to know why they're in that home, what their focus of care is, and what those important documents like the plan of care and like the OASIS, what they actually say. It's super important that they're invested in those answers because when the time comes for a review, the last thing you want is the clinician who saw the patient sitting on their stand with their right hand raised, having to answer questions that they don't know. They do not have a clue about the paperwork because it was being done for them. That is a very risky po uh, proposition, and it's really important that the clinicians know what's going on. Cindy, I'm going to give you one more tough question. We we had a question come in, and we both kind of looked at it. And I think both of our eyes got really, really big, um, and we said, what? <laughs> Again, what? Um, how would you, what kind of recommendations would you give? This is the question. What kind of recommendations would you give to allow for my clinicians to spend less than four hours completing the start of care visit? Okay, I've kind of traced this back. Um, there's, there's some folks out there that are proclaiming that it's going to take four hours to do an admission in 2023. First of all, nobody's done one with Oasis E to be able to even give that kind of a benchmark. And I am sure they are going to take longer in January. This has happened every January after we take an alphabetical change in OASIS because it's a new material. We can prep and prep and prep and prep and prep, but when we actually have to do it with a patient in the home setting, it's going to take a while to get our groove, to get down to a rhythm. And so we do expect it to be longer initially. But if it's still longer in second quarter, then I think that's going to be, what do we need to do differently? Do we need to go out on some co-visits and figure out what the roadblocks might be? Do we need to figure out what some of those obstacles may still be? But I think dropping this idea that it's now going to be four hours and, oh my gosh, we've scared everybody even worse about how catastrophic this is going to be for scheduling and staffing and everything else, and my nurses are going to quit over it. What is that actually founded on? I mean, I don't see four hour admissions. I think that once again, once we find our groove, then we're going to know that I'm assessing these things like I assessed other things. And the majority of these brand new questions, if we just look at them honestly, they're interview questions. And they even give us a script. Ask them this, here's their response options. 
Even the BIMS, oh my gosh, the BIMS is 20 minutes. No, it's not. The very first question, you have to immediately respond with three words. The next three questions, you have a 30 second cutoff to answer. And if you take too long, oh well, you missed it. And when you recall those words at the end, you got five seconds for each one to try. I give you a category cue, you get five more seconds. That's it. So I'm not sure how that translates into all of this, oh my word, extra. When you really look at tools like that, that look complicated if you're not familiar with them, have time limits to each piece. I'm not going to be sitting there waiting 20 minutes to say if they were the, if they can come up with the word sock. I'm not going to do that because right. the tool says not to do that. 100%. And, and also, if you have those opportunities where you have the assistance in the office to help your clinician, you know, sharing those time savers, sharing those patterns in which you perform your start of care is so important. I think that, you know, People eventually come up with their own patterns and their own way of doing things when they get in the home. But when they first start, they're kind of like a shotgun, right? They're all over the mm -hmm. place going from one section to the other section to the other section. That's where precepting is so important. And having someone who has a good process be able to share that with the other clinicians and, and say, I know that eventually you'll come up with your own process, but for now, mine works. I'm going to teach you mine. And once you get to your, your comfort level with mine, then please make edits that work better for how you flow clinically in the home. We're fine with that. I think that would be a big time saver. So the idea of precepting and getting folks comfortable with their patterns of how they do the assessment, their, their nursing or therapy assessment, along with the OASIS and how they blend those two together is super important to use your experienced clinicians and, and the time savers that they've come up with. But well, around I, the BIM, Cindy, go ahead. Well, I, well, I want to just add to that, Sherry, because if you look at the intro piece to the OASIS e-guidance manual, it touches on that and one other thing we've already talked about. And it stresses the importance of accuracy of the assessment and it talks about you know the ability to audit for that and what they suggest and they suggest actually two different routes one is a clinical record audit and another is a clinical visit audit and I think sometimes we've become like it's all about you know reviewing reviewing you know everybody review every note every oasis time point forever and ever amen that's what we're supposed to do even CMS says that that's not the only Thing that they would suggest the going out on a visit because I think there's clinicians that obviously can read well they they're excellent clinicians so they could read the guidance maybe they can take the little quizzes we come up with and do well and and understand when we do scenarios and in the classroom setting or whatever but still struggle in the out with the patient that's an opportunity to say, let's go out, like you said. If Even if you're not new, you've been here a while, I'm coming out with you, or maybe you know we're going back and forth about one particular area of the assessment, let's go out and do this assessment together with a real patient in a real mm -hmm. situation. And I've seen that be incredibly helpful. But what I wanna tag on before you continue, Sherry, is not only does it stress the importance of accuracy and clinical record versus visit, you know, both of them as options, it does also talk about the integrity of that information, that what the clinician submits and what is transmitted to CMS have to match. And mm -hmm. that it's at the discretion of a state surveyor to take a look at are there inconsistencies? So I think that is a very subtle or not so subtle warning that the clinician is the primary driver. They're putting their name and by extension their license on it. But what they turn in better be, even if we disagree at some, what we send to CMS. Because they expect that information to come directly from them. Yes, be reviewed and whatever. But ultimately it needs to match what the clinician is comfortable saying is the answer. I could not agree more, Cindy, and, and that it's so important, you know, and, and folks that are on this call may or may not have been through a heavy audit at one point in time, but it is a scary moment when you receive that audit and you start to look at and see some of these inconsistencies in your record and and you have this opportunity to show that you're doing things the right way. That doesn't mean you can't review the document. That doesn't mean that you can't oh, yeah. make changes to the document. It just means that the clinician has to be involved and agree with the changes that are on that document because there is no such thing as a co-signature on the OASIS document, correct, Cindy? Correct, and we see it even showed up in the Q&As last month 
along these same lines, Sherry, is a question about can information collected prior to the start of care? So could you essentially preemptively answer ethnicity, race, language, transportation, health literacy, social isolation? Like if you already had that information, could it be put in ahead? And basically the response says, if it's available ahead, it still has to be verified and answered during an assessment visit. So it goes on to say, and I'm going to read it literally, any agency software may not, quote, answer or, quote, generate the OASIS response for the assessing clinician. Wow. So they are being very clear that you look at those and you say, oh, what's the big deal? Race, race and ethnicity. Can't someone just answer that before the clinician even goes? Well, you could get the information, but in terms of answering the question, that is the responsibility of the clinician during the assessment visit. I can collect that information ahead of time to help if I want, but to go on and say that the software may not answer or generate the OASIS response for the assessing clinician, there's no way you can sugarcoat or redirect that. That is being explicitly clear about what needs to happen here. A hundred percent. And we have to understand that as compliance folks and as quality folks that we obviously, we oftentimes will know what the correct answer is based on the, the guidance and the OASIS um, uh, manual and the things that it says to do. But we have to educate our clinicians to understand that they are the final say and hopefully they'll choose the answer that's the correct answer based on the guidance in the manual and what they've been educated to provide. But in the in the end, when it comes down to it comes down to the clinician answer 100 percent of the time, whether we like it or whether we don't like it. Um, but I want to ask a question about the BIMS since you mentioned the BIMS. But before I do that, I want to remind folks that if any questions come up during this session, please use the Q&A box and submit the question. Cindy is monitoring that as we speak, and we would love to add in those questions or those further clarifications that maybe um, folks need when they're on the call. And, and if you have any questions beyond that, we, we will be providing our email addresses at the end of this session. And so hopefully we'll get to hear from you all afterwards and, and um, be able to answer your questions. But about the BIMS, um, the BIMS seems to be a hot button topic in the OASIS E. So I'm going to take a question that came in in one form, but I'm going to take the question that came in on the um, Q&As. And it basically said, are we allowed to use cue cards or written pieces of documentation beyond what's on the computer when doing things like the BIMS? Cindy, can you um, reiterate that a little bit and, and explain well, what they allow? What it comes down to with the BIMS is, and if you really think about it, any sort of assessment of mental health or cognitive type issues is they want to make sure we are giving the patient every opportunity to be successful. In terms of we don't want to mix up a language barrier as a mental health issue or a hearing issue as a mental health issue. And so specific to the BIMS, they give us other means by which we could communicate with the patient to assess for this. So yeah, verbally is fine, but we also wanna make sure if they need any hearing appliances, they have them on while we do it, that we're sitting where they can see us, that we're able to you know, actively communicate and, and decrease any background noise. But if we wanna use cue cards, if we need to use cue cards, to, to communicate with the patient, the guidance manual gives us some. They're literally in there, many of you have already seen this, or you could just print off those pages, cut them out, and use them. The question in the Q&A was, basically, if we want to use cue cards, do they have to be paper ones? I mean, do we really have to make paper ones and have the clinician have them somewhere accessible should they need it for an assessment? And CMS response was, you can, make ones on your device. You can have computerized cue cards, but the thing is they have to look exactly like what is meant by the tool. So I would have to look at what they've provided in the guidance manual and say what I'm doing, if I'm going to be putting it on my computer or use it, my laptop for this, it has to follow the exact language as to that item set. So they're giving us the option to say you could do it, and in many cases, I think that's that's a positive, as opposed to physically carrying around pieces of paper or cardboard just in case I need it, and probably lose it or something bad spill on it. But if it's in the device, 
hmm, as long as it meets this and it didn't vary the tool in some way, I can do it. So that raises questions of pursuing it with my EMR vendor. Are you going to give this to me? Is this already in here as an option? Or can you do this for me as an option? As well as, okay, I got no option for my EMR. Can I put something on this laptop or device that would allow them to do that? As long as it doesn't change the intent or the wording or anything about the questions, they're saying you can. And I think that's a positive. 100% and I, I, I think that it's super important that we come up with a consistent way of doing that when we have those folks that have hearing challenge, potentially vision challenge, accompanying hearing challenges um, and, and or language challenges. We need to have um, a policy potentially written that says how we address those things so that if they're in the situation of a survey, you can demonstrate that you have taught your clinicians how this is supposed to go down whether it goes down that way is a whole other thing but that can keep a, a second level um, citation into a one a first level citation by simply having that policy and teaching it to your folks and, and demonstrating that you did teach it to your folks that you did an in-service or something along those lines um, but i think by extension sherry if if i can put my cue cards for the bims on my device then when we think about the assessment of vision which in oasis e is very much about being able to identify letters or numbers or images in regular or large size, then the ability to have that on a device as opposed to paper would also be an option. And that's why it, with respect to teaching that item, I've been talking to agencies about what tools do you want the clinician to use for this? You may say, well, if it's just, you know, normal, I mean, regular and large font, you could probably pull that directly out of the materials. All that stuff we give them as part of the admission. Sure, but if that doesn't work, if they can't read or this the English is not their first language and this isn't going to work well, I can do it with numbers. Well, where am I going to find regular and large size numbers? And if numbers don't work, I can use images of comparable sizes of both sizes. Well, where am I going to find that? So by extension to this response about the cue cards, I think we can also say what else on my device can be at the fingertips of the clinician should they have to go down the route of numbers and especially images. I think you could probably find numbers of two different sizes in that admission packet as well, but images may be a different story and that might be the opportunity to tie it together, the cue cards and those other tools so that I'm not in the home scrambling around trying to figure out what I'm gonna do now because I'm not sure, which just adds to time, adds to aggravation and thus unnecessary stress. Absolutely. And we have some questions that came in, so I'm going to go on to the next one. We have a couple about physician's orders. Is it required to have a physician order within the patient charge chart any time a patient elects to change their health care provider? This is something our agency has done since inception, but I'm not sure if it's legally necessary. If it is to do so, then, then let us know. Thoughts? Now, it's, it's my understanding, and you can jump in based on some of the, the digging you did around for these questions today, um, is that we are required to have an order to say that they've changed providers. That is correct, that we don't really need one. Yes, that's my understanding. <laughs> Listen, my brain is so stuck in the Oasis lane right now, Sherry, and I gotta get out of it, it needs me a second to reset. But it's I my understanding we don't need an order. No, we don't need an order. We would obviously need an order if they were changing our care in any way, um, right. you know, either the frequency or the interventions that we're providing or any of the goals that we may have for a patient. Obviously, that would need to come with a physician, physician signature. But I do right. want to iterate. It, this is a great opportunity to iterate that in the first five days when you're completing the OASIS and you're reviewing the face to face. And if there's multiple physicians, those do need to appear in the plan of care. And it needs to be written in a way that that the um, signer of the plan of care, the physician signer of the plan of care, or the um, secondary, the ARMP or PA signer in, in the states that allow that, that they have the opportunity to know that there are other providers on the case. So that that's super important. Real, real good clarification that when you're starting a plan of care and you go into the patient's house and they have three doctors, it's not an, it's not unusual for that to happen. You may have a cardiologist, a pulmonologist and a, and a general practitioner. Those if any of those guys, those folks are doing any of the ordering of the care that you're going to be provided, they need to appear on the plan of care. That's my only clarification of that. Right. 
and that that goes for the recertification plan of care. Say you pick up a physician or they change midstream in, a, in an episode of care, you need to make sure that that's updated on the new plan of care going into the second 60 days if that patient's going to be re, um, recerted. And that may change who signs the plan of care. It depends on who's providing the, the most care that's, re, that's germane to the care that you're providing to the patient in the home. But Sherry, wouldn't you also say though, even if we're if if you don't need an order that states patient is changing provider too, because then you'd wonder who would even sign it, like the outgoing physician or the incoming, you would still expect documentation in the record as to this has been the change, the patient is doing X, um, so that there's at least a trail in the record. So when orders start now coming signed by maybe a different physician, we now made it very clear how we ended up there. Exactly, and and just it, it, you want to be as communicative as possible, but not get yourself back to do a corner where you had the wrong person sign that change order, and then you're then you're in a in a screwy situation that you then have to go back to the original order of home health. It gets to be very convoluted. Anytime you get to that second or third step, you have to start asking yourself, "Is this something I have to do?" Um, right. And and most of the time, when it when it goes past one step or when it goes past that feeling in your gut, whether it's right or wrong. Then it's probably not something that's that's qualified. And again, goes back to those rumors, Cindy. Make sure that you ask someone to see the regulation, see it in writing when they tell you something has to be done. Always, if they say the words "always" or "never," you want to be able to attach a reg to it um, and be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. an another question on orders. This one always seems to get asked. Um, and I'll and I'll caveat. This was actually asked about therapy. Can a physical therapist assistant perform wound care with a physician's order? Well, Sherry, as a physical therapy assistant, would, assistant, would you like to feel that one? <laughs> Absolutely. As a physical therapy assistant in the state of Florida, I'm going to use the state because the State Practice Act is really clear in most states who can take orders and whom they have to take them from and all of those things. But as I can speak as a physical therapist assistant in Florida. The only person that I can receive an order for care from is a physical therapist. It's very clear in our State Practice Act and in many State Practice Acts that the supervising therapist or the therapist that under which the PTA is working are the only ones that can give you care orders. So say a physician sends in a wound care order and the PTA is the prime clinician on that patient. You have to have the therapist go out and change their plan of care, change their interventions, change their goals, and write a note that is basically ordering the physical therapist to do the type of wound care that is required. So you have to step in and have that extra step um, in order to make that compliant. Cindy, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think it, what it comes down to is it does need to be explicitly then in the physical therapy plan of care so that it can be followed up on. But I want to reiterate, State Practice Act can have a lot to do with this about who can do what, who is qualified to do what. And I always, whenever we get into things like um, wound care, yes, they can. The question is, are they competent and proficient? Yes. Because I've also seen situations where it's, oh, it says you can. Hey, you go do it. And it's like, wait a minute, I, I haven't done it in forever. Um, I haven't you know, done it in a long time. Maybe I never, ever did that element. Um, it's in the scope technically, but as an individual clinician, I maybe have to say, wait a second, I need to brush up on that. I need to go to some additional education. I mean, again, it's the issue of what's allowable for the profession, but what comes down to the individual competence of an individual clinician. So we have to be very careful when we say, yes, it's in scope, as long as we've checked everything from the state and, and regulatory bodies that it's allowed, we still need to make sure that that individual is distinctly proficient and there can be high degree of variability. There can be, but I'll just speak to PT Sherry, there can be PTs that love wound care and they get all up in there and they do great things. And then there's other PTs that if you ask them to do wound care, they might literally pass out because that just isn't their wheelhouse. Physical therapy can do it, but maybe not all physical therapists should. And so that's where you have to look at that and say, do I have individuals that really have this skill set and can be a huge addition to my wound care program? And then maybe I have some that need to get some additional training or I don't want them falling face first into the wound. That's disgusting and get me all kinds of paperwork. So maybe that one shouldn't do it and this one can. 
And, and I just want to say to folks that are on the call that physical therapy, I can only speak for physical therapy, all physical therapists have had training in wound care. Is that a fair statement, Cindy? Yes. Okay, it is part of our school curriculum. It's part of the physical therapist assistance school curriculum. Many therapists are advanced in wound care and can actually do sharps debridement and those kinds of things because of certifications that they have attained after they've left school. But I'm gonna be very clear. It's like a dialysis nurse or a ostomy nurse versus a general practitioner nurse. If you do not want someone teaching on an ostomy that only got the basic skills when they were in school, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there are new advancements to all of these things. And wound care is one of the fastest advancing. And so you want to make sure that someone is not just competent, but they've kept up with that skill set and that they understand what to do. Now, I'm going to really blow some minds as far as changing addressing that has already been placed or, or uh, placing a dislodged dressing, those kinds of things are completely within the scope of your physical therapist and your physical therapist assistant. And anytime you have a wound, I would highly recommend that you have your physical therapist add a, an intervention for a dislodged dressing or those kinds of things ahead of time. Whether they're going to address that wound as far as the actual care that's provided is a, hundred, is a different thing. But the last thing you want to do in the environment that we're in with the hiring and the retention and having enough bodies and not wanting to waste your capital and your visits is have someone make a phone call from the house for a dislodged, dislodged dressing to have the nurse come out. That's just not great teamwork, number one, and it's super inefficient in your care. So those are things that you can look at ahead of time, understanding that the PTA has to be able to take her orders or their orders from the physical therapist. So having that stuff on the plan of care in all the disciplines is a good idea. And in, even in occupational therapy, many of them have extensive wound training um, because of what they do with their hands and, and, and different specialties. So, you know, get to know your staff, have them involved in in-services like, K, um, is it KPI, the wound vac? Have them come to the wound vac um, in-services. Have them see who enjoys wounds, see who wants to be part of your wound care team. All of those things can create efficiencies and decrease unnecessary visits and unnecessary cost. So, so I hope I didn't blow your mind and I hope I didn't upset any therapists that are on the call, but the jig is up. Okay, <laughs> the jig is up, Sydney. Um, we can absolutely assist in the wound care process. Um, this next one is kind of peripherally about orders, but it's also an interesting question that comes up all the time. Um, can therapists or assistants perform aid visits? Can I change that question, Cindy? Please feel free. Okay, I'm gonna change it. And, and, and here's why. I, who on your team is allowed to perform aid visits? Question mark. <laughs> Go for it, Sherry. I mean, we should have set up a poll for that and see what, what our, our poll results could have been. Okay, so what the aid performs in the home requires many different skills and tasks. An aid visit is oftentimes comprised of many things cleaning the beds, the beds, helping someone get into the shower, helping someone with their toileting. There is a list as, as long as my arm of what can be on an aid plan of care, right, Cindy? And mm -hmm. each of those things, each of those things, a transfer from a toilet requires certain tasks that have to happen. They have to have a certain amount of strength in their legs. They have to have a certain amount of range of motion. They have to have a certain amount of dexterity. All of those things you will often find in your therapy plan of care, right? Mm -hmm. Just maybe not associated with what they're, what they're doing with that patient on their rehab, during their rehab time, but could be focused towards more of their personal care time. I would lean away from saying that another discipline is going to perform an aid visit, and I would lean into peppering your documentation with your therapists, your LPNs, your nurses, your even your speech therapist, yes, even your speech therapist, that those tasks are in the plan of care so that there's, it's seamless. If you have an aide who is sick one day and can't make that visit, that there doesn't have to be a big rigmarole and new orders written. It's just an expl explanation that today your range of motion and your strengthening is going to have to occur during their self-care. 
This is one of those all hands on deck situations. And Cindy may disagree with me, but I don't think that that's outside the scope. I just think that we have to look at it a little bit different. I, yeah, because I think the whole we can just substitute has always got kind of issues around it in terms mm -hmm. of who are we utilizing? Why are we utilizing? Um, but the all hands on deck, to me, the natural connection has always been to OT. I mean, we put an aid in there for a reason. People don't get aid orders because they're doing so wonderful with their self care that that's what we just wanted to give them an audience. And aid is there to assist with that. And so, can we, by extension, say, okay, we're utilizing OT to try to manage this particular activity, but today now the aid to help them with more routine performance is not available to pivot and say, okay, we're going to go through a full bathing task as part of this visit, and I'm going to be doing my assessing and all that wonderful OTness at the same time, but we're going to go through the full task, get that done because it needed to be done, and then we're able to incorporate that into another visit. I think that, you know, a speech language pathologist, no offense, might fall over dead if we said that they had to go ahead and do a shower during the visit, PT falling over maybe very quickly behind them. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, looking at that connection between occupational therapy and aid services has been a head scratcher for me for a very long time, Sherry, of why yes. we don't see more connectivity between those. If I'm putting in an aid, why would I not get at least a consult to say, is this something we could do differently? Um, are we putting in an aid who's now providing too much assistance and now the patient is coming to rely on it and now we're coming to the end of an episode and we're all in panic mode now what are we going to do they're upset if they lose their aid because they kind of forgot how to wash themselves because they had somebody do it for them i mean i think there's a more strategic way to manage this but i also understand that in certain situations it is an all hands on deck issue and and i myself i wouldn't say it was a regular occurrence but you get there and everything's gone wrong and there's a big mess and somebody has to get cleaned up i don't i don't have a clean up on aisle 7 button like i did when in the, i was in the hospital so I can't really just go, hey, well, that kind of stinks. I'm leaving. Um, how can I help to the best of my ability? Because that's a very real situation for the patient. It occurs, it occurs quite often. And, and we, we encourage you to educate your staff about being all on one team and understanding that it's about the dignity and care of the patient. So when they come upon a situation where the patient is soiled or there is an accident or something along those lines, it's not about what your job title is and how, what your ego is surrounding your job title. It's about taking care of that individual in front of you as if they were a family member. And, and I say that very clearly as if they were a family member that you like and Cindy I should probably add that right. caveat because many of us have family members that we would maybe just run from in those situations but as as care providers we have to maintain that that heart in our job and understand that this is not something that is going to replace your regular job it's just a necessity of, of taking care of someone who is at home and wants to stay there um, well, and Cindy, Sherry, I, I just I, we, we have a question come in that's a follow-up to this so I'm going to ask you this one so all right some agencies are having the OTA do their visit end it and then do a separate visit as an aide Another issue is if OT isn't involved and the OTA is used as an aid, so now you run into issues with supervision laws. Yes. Um, the second scenario is no bueno, in my opinion. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to have, you have to look at your state practice act and see what's required of the supervision and the, the task orientation for the, the CODA versus the OT. I, I am not as familiar with the OT laws and the, the state practice acts on that, but I would be very, very clear that you're having them do what they're supposed to do per their practice act. Anytime we do a task in the home, we are held to the regulations of the highest licensure that we hold. So, you can't just flip a switch and all of a sudden your liability is only that of an aid if you hold a CODA license. Let me make, make sure I made that really clear. You cannot flip a switch and only have them have the responsibility of an aid if they hold a CODA license. So the first scenario is something that you could do, but again, based on what we just talked about, Cindy, why? Why wouldn't mm -hmm. you just incorporate that into the CODA visit and have it be part of their visit? 
Um, there's nothing that says you have to make a certain number of aid visits. You would probably have to make a this visit or a clarification visit order to let the physician know that you had a situation where the aide couldn't make it. So the CODA incorporated that into her visit. That to me feels more right. Cindy, is that is that something that you well, agree with? The the only thing I the other risk I see here is if someone is looking at that later and sees an opportunity to turn this into a lupa by assuming that yes. you're trying to make two visits out of one. Um, you may say, well, no, 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 I was just trying to keep it clear. And, uh, there, there could be very simple reasons we did it, but it could also be misinterpreted as you did it to drive up a visit number, uh, particularly if the total visits in that 30 day period just put you over the lupa line. That could very easily just be completely nixed as that was all one visit from an OTA and no, the, that visits out, that visits out, and that visits out, and thank you, give me this money back because now you're a lupa. Yep, that's the other, the other thing you have to take into deep consideration. So I wanted to reiterate that we have about 15 minutes left to go in our session, and if you guys have any other Q&A question or, or questions that you have come up during the session, please add them to the Q&A box so that we can address as many as possible in the next 15 minutes. And I also just switched the screen to show you our connection information. If you want to reach out to Cindy, um, please reach out to her at craft at valuebeyondthevisit.com and you can reach me at teaguebeyondthevisit.com or you can check us out at our website uh, www.valuebeyondthevisit.com. Um, we've had this website extension for since 2013 when visits were still the thing that we counted. Um, we don't count visits anymore, but we still feel there's many, many values that we all have in home health beyond just take, making a visit. Um, Cindy, I um, have another Sherry, question. I want to take the next one. I want to take the next one. Go for um, it. You always ask all the questions. There's one in here I want to make sure we get to today, and you just teed it up with the value beyond the visit. So okay. we know that in Oasis E, there are three different pain assessment questions. Um, and one is specific to is pain interfering with rehabilitation services and participation in rehab. Someone wrote the question that came out in the October Q and A's where it's talking about the rehab therapy definition in the guidance manual. Um, talks about special health care service or programs that help a person regain physical, mental and or cognitive thinking and learning abilities that have been lost or impaired due to re result of disease, injury or treatment. Okay, so the fact that it said programs or services that help a person regain these abilities, they asked if based on the term regain, would maintenance therapy not be considered rehab therapy for this item? I'm like, okay, hold up, hold up. Now we're we're bringing to this is the first time sure I've ever seen two of the topics I am most passionate about end up in one spot. <laughs> and maintenance therapy. It's like a collision right here. And I look at it and say, okay, no offense to whoever asked that question. What it's saying is we're still stuck in this idea that maintenance therapy is some other kind of therapy. Yeah. It is not another kind of therapy. It is simply changing what the end target is. I'm still doing interventions that look the same. My treatment strategies may be the same. I'm still gait training and transferring and Therex and ADL retraining and cognitive, re I'm doing those same things, but the end result I'm going for is stabilization of function versus improvement of function. It's not a whole separate thingy that would be extricated from the idea of PT, OT and speech. So I wanna reiterate there, I thought it was interesting somebody picked out that word regain and wanted to tie it to maintenance but you know what happens sherry when we ask questions i think we need to be very careful when we pose these questions to cms i mean there, there's great questions and there's opportunities to get information clarified and i'm glad they have the q a cycle but sometimes when we ask things we poke a bear or we find out mm -hmm. pieces of information that maybe we didn't really think about and so by extension, I wanted to let our listeners know to please make sure we're paying attention to that particular item, J520, in terms of how they're defining rehab therapy. Not getting down into this rabbit hole about if it's maintenance or not, because that's not the issue. I want to make sure I read this verbatim. Rehabilitation therapies may 
include treatment supervised in person by a therapist or nurse or other staff or the patient family caregivers carrying out a prescribed therapy program without agency staff present regardless of the rehab focus or goals. So when they're talking about is pain limiting their participation in therapy, it is not just addressing sessions with a therapist present. It's things that have been assigned to this patient to do, maybe not in the presence of the therapist, that a nurse is supervising, that a staff member is supervising, that a family member is supervising, that a patient is carrying out on their own. Has their participation been limited by pain? So this is a way bigger question than did you get PTOT speech and you know did you limit your participation when they try to have a therapy session? It, it could be that, but it could be these other elements as well. And to that end, I'm seeing a lot of people already misinterpret this as if it's saying, did you have pain doing therapy? Oh my yeah. gosh, heaven help us if that was the question. <laughs> because we know that there are gonna be situations where, yeah, you're gonna. I mean, you had your knee yeah. done, we have to bend the knee, it's gonna hurt. This is not whether or not pain, you have pain with therapy, with a therapist present or doing your home exercise program on your own. It's absolutely, did you limit your participation because it hurt? And that's very different than did it hurt? And we don't wanna mix those things up. So when you were talking about therapy, Sherry, it just hit me and then the, co the coalition colliding of OASIS and then maintenance and then, oh yeah, by the way, remember that therapy isn't just being there with a therapist. I think it's something, once again, with OASIS, we don't necessarily think like that, but we're gonna to have to make sure we think like that so we co collect the correct response. Sydney, I'm gonna ask an extension to that question. What happens if there is no therapy ordered for that patient. They they came in with nursing only and there is not any therapist involved nor therapy ordered in that patient. Is it that does. is that a question you can answer in a positive oh, yeah. in an affirmative oh, way? It is because this question has nothing to do with what's going to happen in home care. It's asking okay. over the past 5 days. Ah. So the question specifically says in the five the, the last 5 days have you limited your participation in so this is where you have to look and say, if they came to us, they were discharged from a rehab in the last five days, most likely, overwhelmingly, they had therapy. If it was from a skilled nursing facility, also most pretty likely. Hospital, we might have to do some digging. And don't assume community referrals didn't. Um, right. Even if maybe they had outpatient therapy that stopped two weeks ago, well outside the parameter, but they still had home program activities that they needed to keep doing well, they didn't do them. Okay, that means, no, it has to be that they didn't participate fully because of pain. This is not about compliance. This is not about, I just didn't want to do it, or I forgot, or the dog ate it, or whatever. It is about, I am choosing to hold back because it hurts. So it is a specific time window, but it, it's it's a bit more complex than I think. And then it has nothing to do with whether or not the approach of care was maintenance by that therapist or not. Awesome. Well, thank you for answering that. And I have one last question I think we can fit in in the next five minutes. And it's, it's an interesting one. Does anyone have any adv advice or information for what needs to be included in routine assessments that do not have an OASIS time point? For home care patients, are we able to do a more focused assessment only on routine follow-up versus a more thorough assessment at every single visit. This goes to Cindy, the, the statement that we heard um, recently where they said they could not um, train uh, their new nurses that were coming in without experience and then um, ask them to do the OASIS at the same time teaching them how to do an assessment in the home. What, what do you think that framework looks like in, in most clinical situations, not just nursing, but also with the therapist? You do your thorough start of care evaluation and your assessment head to toe the whole bit. But what is allowed and what is expected beyond that when it's not an OASIS time point? Okay, I, I want to just kind of big picture and work our way down. I think a lot of it starts when we start trying to define a comprehensive assessment. 
-hmm. And we know that OASIS is part of that, but OASIS will never stand alone as a complete patient assessment because it's discipline neutral data collection. What we put around it, CMS has not ever said, here is the exact definitive checklist of what else goes with it. They defer to things that, you know, we need to be compliant from a condition of participation standpoint. We need to be able to speak to qualifying and coverage criteria. Then, depending on my discipline, I run into some discipline specific things that get deferred to professional organizations that set those kinds of standards of what should be in that assessment, what you can reasonably expect in a discipline specific assessment. So, what we often get left with is a comprehensive assessment is OASIS. It's my discipline specific stuff and then it's this other stuff that needs to be there because this is home care and because I have to deal with the COPs and those kinds of things. What I think unfortunately happens very often is we're not strategic in this and a lot of it has to do with our EMR. The OASIS is the OASIS, we can't do anything about that so that we'll put to the side. I need to meet the, the what is specific to my discipline and what have we agreed upon is part of this regardless of discipline. So the remaining piece of the comprehensive assessment. I think a lot of times where we get confused about what's actually required is because that comprehensive assessment in the majority of EMRs leans very heavily to nursing. And then, okay, now we're gonna do a PT admit. We're gonna have OT admit now that they can. We're gonna have speech admit. And then we take an evaluation of that discipline and just stick it in addition to all this other stuff. But what we need to do is look at that other stuff from the perspective of a comprehensive assessment and say, what is reasonable? What should be here regardless of the discipline of the person completing it? And what really is nursing specific and should not be part of the expectation for a therapist to do it. And this can get, you know, kind of janky about, well, I don't want to do it. That's not the issue. It's what is part of a good comprehensive assessment, regardless of discipline, that then in conjunction with the OASIS and my discipline specific evaluation creates a reasonable comprehensive assessment for me to do. I think because it leans heavily to nursing very often, I mean, one of the major EMRs I will not name, if you go to their website, has a big old banner on it, made by nurses for nurses. Great, that must mean as therapist, I don't have to use it. Um, but we have to look at this and say, what, what do we actually need to have? So then when I'm looking at my, my piece of it, whether I'm doing the admission or now I'm not, the fundamental elements of that discipline specific evaluation should be consistent. What needs to be in there? And I think that takes us looking at our EMR boxes and fields and check areas. What actually meets the, the expectation? We should never assume that what we got from the EMR is what has to be done by some outside standard and it's all about regulation. I'm not saying anything mean about them. They're selling a product and very often they are adding features based on what customers ask them for not necessarily vetting with any professional association or outside entity, whether that makes sense to put there or not. I mean, when a client asks an EMR to give them the option of homebound status to be patient refuses to leave the home and the EMR gives that to them, you realize how far off the rails we can go. That is not a valid homebound reason. It never has been a valid homebound reason. And if it was, I'm going to decide that tomorrow, Sherry. I'm not leaving home. I can't work. So you are homebound. I have time to homebound. homebound. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we need to sit down and look at those against professional resources and say, okay, I need this. I need this. I don't need this. Well, if I can remove it somehow, that's fine. But if I can't, I still don't need it. And so I'm gonna tell my staff, when you hit this part, skip it. I'm telling you to skip it. I'm giving you permission to skip it. These other parts, you're not skipping it. And I think by a collaborative approach, using those kinds of resources, we can get to those tools we need to be, 
but I think a lot of it is a, a mishmash of things that have ended up in EMRs that we can't really decipher anymore. What's a requirement? What's compliant? Why am I asked the same thing three different ways? Well, that's because different clients ask for it different ways. Well, I don't want two of them. Then, then don't use two of them. But you don't want to leave that up to an individual clinician who might get in a bad mood and say, I'm not answering 90% of this. Okay, wait a minute. Yes. We need to set the standard. And and you have to have a clinical um, policy and procedure as mm -hmm. it is. And I think a lot of these things, if you put together a, a, a multidisciplinary clinical committee, you can come up with the framework of what those in-between visit assessments look like and put that into your clinical policies and procedures. So you have it as a reference tool when you're doing onboarding and you're doing things with folks that maybe aren't as um, as vested or as, as, as experienced, because I understand a lot of folks are hiring younger and more inexperienced clinicians due to the, the fact that it's a tough hiring environment right now. So leaning on your policies and procedures, and again, leaning on your experienced clinicians and the home care hacks that they've already come up with um, during their experiential learning in the, in the process. Thank you guys so much. We're ending the session and I wanted to say thank you all so much for attending these this year. We really enjoyed putting them together and I hope that everyone has a very healthy and happy holiday season and look for a extended unfiltered production that will be coming out and it will be the things that Cindy and I hope to see in 2023. Um, it kind of rhymes a little bit what we hope to see in 2023. Cindy, what do you think? I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation. Yes. So those of you that aren't prescribing to or haven't prescribed or, or subscribed to our YouTube channel, please take the opportunity to do so. We will be sending out this recording um, in one of our news, newsletter blasts, but we'll also be housing this recording on our YouTube channel, which is where we put all of our free information and you can get notified when we upload new stuff. But that will be coming out in the next month or so. Um, and, and trust, it will be entertaining, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> If nothing else, you'll see the id that exists in Cindy and I. When it comes to home health. Um, but thank you all so much, and I hope everyone has a really um, wonderful holiday season.